All right, the next thing we want to talk about, it's over on 198. Uh, there's a list of all the provisions of a sales contract. We are t not going to go through this whole list. Once again, there's not a question that says name seven things, name seven the thing. But on 199, there's this thing called a contingency. A contingency is an action, an activity, something that has to happen for the deal to move forward. We typically have inherently three contingencies that we use all of the time. They are in the purchase agreement. The first one's being the mortgage or financing contingency. When the buyer says, I will buy this property subject to me being able to get this loan. If I fail to get the loan, then the deal's done. That's what a contingency is. We also typically have what's called an inspection contingency. We have a property sale contingency. What that says, I will buy the home subject to me selling the home I live in, in now because the equity in my current home is my down payment for the loan I'm going to use to buy your new home. So it's a property sale contingency that all of these have to be cleared for us to move forward. Now, if I can't sell my home, then I'm not liable for a specific performance because you gave me that out. Think of a contingency as an out. Anything can be a contingency subject to my dog singing the alphabet. If you both agree it, we had one several years ago where I took a guy up to the north side and he said, hey, look, I want to see the property. It's a hot market. This was back in 04. Um, my wife is gone, but I don't want to miss the house. So we wrote an offer full price subject to his wife's approval within 48 hours. So when we went to the airport and picked the wife up, she's like, hi, honey, who's this? I'm like, hey, I'm the realtor. Get in the car. <laughs> we went straight to the house, and she signed off on it and said, yeah, I love the house. Let's buy it. So we had to remove or waive or clear. You hear all three of those. Remove the contingency. We cleared the contingency. Uh, we waived the contingency. Those all work inherently the same. A lot of times in the real estate world, title companies do this for you. So you guys don't even know this is going on. They'll call, oh, we, yeah, we've cleared contingency, or we cleared the lien that was on the property, or we know the payoff. The last one, contingency, is a new one that we started using called a lien holder approval. A lien holder approval would be if your seller is using a short sale. You guys know what a short sale is. A short sale is when the lender is accepting less than the person actually owes. It does take forever. All right? So if they owe 100 and the buyer says, I'll give 90, that typically wouldn't clear the lien because they owed 100. We went through that. But if the seller, if the lender says, yes, we'll take 90, then we can sell the property. So you've got to get a lien holder approval on that. That's another contingency. Now, this next section to me should have been way back a couple of earlier pages. We talked about the novation and we talked about the assignment. Nobody asked, which you may say, hey, I'll get to it, which I hear I go. What's the mechanism to do that? How do we change documents? This is how. The first one is called an amendment. An amendment is exactly what it sounds like it is. It amends stuff we've already talked about. If we agreed that time is of the essence was 30 days, Victoria, and here we say we need more than 30 days, we would novate the contract. Hey, let's move it out five more days. We would do that through an amendment. I would send an amendment to you that says we need to change the closing date from you know January the 1st to February the 1st and amend what we wrote on the original contract. And if you said yes, 
then that amendment is incorporated into that purchase agreement. So now we have until February the 1st, time is of the essence to close. That's an amendment. The second contract that you may use is what's called an addendum. Addendum, hence the word add. In an addendum, you actually add words that are not talked about. Like, I want the swing set, the pool table, yada, 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 all to be added to the purchase agreement. Since there's no space on our purchase agreement to talk about that, we will use this other form called an addendum and add some other terminology or some other conditions in there to the contract. We had one where the sellers or where the buyers wanted to keep all of the rocks, which I think we should have kept anyway. You know, those big decorative rocks? But we put that on an addendum. Seller to leave, you know, all the rocks lining the patio, the big rock out front, all of that. Yeah, if you wanted to add furniture, you could put it on the addendum. Now, we have a little section called Further Conditions at the bottom of our purchase agreement. I advise my agents they should use an addendum as a whole separate form. And there's a reason that you should do it that way. But since I'm recording, I don't want nobody to hear what the reason is. <laughs> no, that's not true. Lenders sometimes don't like to see personal property on a purchase agreement because then they think you're trying to mortgage it. So a lot of lenders will come back and go, we want you to move all that stuff to an addendum. It's just, it's a quirk in some of the lenders. So th that's another reason that you would use that. <laughs> disclosures, we have many disclosures that we talk about. Uh, we've got the lead-based paint disclosure. We've got the sales disclosure. We've got all this other stuff that's going on. But the big thing I want to touch on before we call it quits is this thing called an option. Now, we've talked about the option already. Remember, we have an option or would be the person giving the option like the seller. The option E would be the one taking the option. And because it's a contract, you got to have consideration, so you have this thing called option consideration. You guys are making me paranoid when you're staring out the door like that. Yeah. Leslie, yeah. there's someone in the hallway. No, this hallway, the real hallway. People start peeking in and they see the live class a lot of times and they're like, oh. So, so you have the option or the one giving the option, the option E, and because it's a contract, remember we need consideration, so you got this thing called option consideration. And an option is the right to do something in the future that you require now. Don't sound shocked that someone sent me flowers, Miguel. It's actually for Lynn, it said. Take my percentage of that, though. Take my three flowers out of it. <laughs> All right. Pet peeve number one, depending on what day you, we get to. I've had three pet peeve number ones, if you haven't noticed this. This is something that, once again, people use all the time, and I'm telling you right now, there is no such thing as rent to own. Does not exist, all right? It's a misnomer that everybody's tried to use. Now we all use it because everybody thinks they know what it is. So let's go over something. Remember what the grantor and the grantee when were they used, those words? In a sale, right? 
And in a typical sale, how quick does the property transfer? Instantly, right? So in a sale, the proper the property transfers instantly. Now we have this thing also called a lessor and a lessee. How quickly does ownership transfer between a lessor and a lessee? Trick question. It never transfers. Ownership doesn't transfer, right? <clears throat> never. True ownership never transfers. So what we have to date are these grantor grantee, which is a sale that happens boop instantly, and this other thing we use called the lessor lessee, which is a lease. Ownership never transfers. Well, we've got one other that I want to talk about. We can actually transfer ownership over time based on the amount of money the person puts down. It is called a land contract. Land contract. Because it transfers the amount of time, we actually have to come up with new words. So what we have now is this thing called a vendor and a vendee. The transfer of ownership happens over time. And it's based upon the amount of money that the vendee pays to the vendor. This is kind of a visual joke, so I want you to try and get this at home. On a sale, we have ownership that goes boop, right? And it's 100% transfers all at one time. On a lessor, lessee, never transfers. But what we have now is this one, where every time the buyer makes a payment, there's a small portion of ownership that transfers until it finally gets to the all of it, and then it's all transferred. Transfers over time. It's based on the amount of money, and what's the word for money we use? What? <laughs> okay, you're right, consideration. What I was going for was equity. That's where the term equitable title comes from, or equitable interest, because the vendee has equitable interest in the property. He owns some portion of it. At any given moment, he may own 43.8%. Then he makes two more monthly payments, now he owns 54%. Then he makes eight more payments, now he owns 61%. So it's based on the amount of money he's paying. That's where the term equitable comes in. So the vendor has actual title. It still shows up in the records under vendor's name. The vendee has equitable title. And you can remember equitable because equitable is based on number, money. And that's what equity is. Sometimes you will hear the vendor's actual title. It could also be called naked title because he has ownership but not possession. Who possesses the property? It's not a buyer. That's where most people get... <laughs> yes. Buyer implies grantee and ownership transfers instantly. So you can't use the word buyer, it's the vendee. This is where most people who think they're suave in real estate end up hanging themselves in a court because they use that word. And then the attorney's going to go, they're not a buyer. They're a vendee. They're also not a lessee. Hence the word people go rent to own. It's virtually impossible. It's not virtually. It is impossible. Rent is a word you use with a lessor and lessee. And we already said ownership never transfers. 
Now, sometimes you hear them called the Vendy buyer. I've seen somebody say that in the vendor seller or the seller vendor. Because nobody knows the real truth and they take advantage of that. They tell people, it's, oh, you can rent the property and then at the end you own it. Well, that's a land contract. You can call it whatever you want. And there have already been plenty of court cases where if you give ownership on a monthly basis, it is a land contract. It's not a rent to own. Rent, now the other option is what we just said. You can have a lease with an option. Yes, a lot of times people will advertise it to uneducated people and say it's a rent to buy when it's really not. It's a lease with an option. So what the option is though, an option is just a sale. When you exercise your option, it's between or it will be a re real sale, pff, property transfers. Until then, you're a tenant. Now there are advantages because here's the advantage. If you're a tenant of mine, with an option to buy, during your tenancy period, you violate it, small claims court, I evict you. If I give you ownership, as in a land contract, I can't evict you, I have to foreclose upon you and take back your equitable title to the property. So I tell every, all my investors, sell on a lease option, buy on a land contract. You want to sell on a lease option, that way during the leasing period, a victim. But you want to buy in case you mess up, make them take you to foreclosure court. <laughs> so there is no such thing as a lease, or there is a lease option or a land content. No such thing as a rent to own. It's impossible. Uh, tenants in common really have nothing to do with this. Tenants in common is a form of ownership. When you take ownership as a grantor or a grantee, your grantee could be tenants in common. But I meant this is the two different styles. That's a form of ownership. All right? Any questions about that? Sometimes you hear it called a land installment sale, owner financing but it's technically a land contract. So when you do a land contract, though, it will specify what type of ownership. When you buy, you mean like fee simple? Yeah. If you're buying fee simple, yeah, you would buy the land contract as a fee simple absolute or some. All that would be disclosed in there. You're just, the other good thing about a land contract is you can record it and get the owner. In Indiana, you can get the uh, homeowner's uh, deduction on a land contract because you have equitable title. As a tenant, you can't get the homeowner's deduction. You get a renter's deduction on the IRS form. I have a friend who looks at the property and is like, this person, 99%, and my friend, 1%. Yeah. They have an interest in the property. Sorry. Is it a... Well, if they do an owner of tenants in common, once again, John, don't, these are just methods of transfer. That is the form of a transfer. You could transfer through a grantor and a grantee instantly where the grantee is a tenant in common or a joint tenant or a corporation. It would still transfer at instantly as this method. You could do a Vendee as a corporation, I guess. It's a legal entity. It would be hard to take them to court. All right, that's chapter 11.